Bon matin à tout le monde. Bienvenue dans une autre conférence de notre cycle annuel des conférences sur la recherche en droit. Je remercie votre présence. Aujourd'hui, nous avons le grand honneur de recevoir Rebecca Jerenko Bromwich, qui est la directrice du programme du deuxième cycle en résolution de conflits au département de droit et études juridiques de l'Université Carleton. Euh, C'est une conférence qui, est, euh, donc, euh, qui a été possible grâce à notre collaboration euh, avec euh, le laboratoire euh, de recherche interdisciplinaire sur les droits de, de l'enfant. Et donc, euh, pour toutes sortes de raisons, notamment parce que je perds un petit peu ma voix, j'ai demandé à ma collègue, mon appareil, de nous faire une présentation en bonne et due forme de notre conférencière que je remercie euh, infiniment d'être venue ici aujourd'hui. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, je vais parler en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions forcées, vous, vous pouvez les me demander après et je vais uh, essayer à répondre. Je vais uh, faire mon mieux. Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Bromwich. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, the research I'm doing with respect to tech in the uh, family law context um, and the project I'm working on and how that Uh, falls into the current uh, changes to the Divorce Act that will be affected by Bill C-78 that is currently uh, before Senate. It has passed the House and it's now at, before the Senate um, and there's some significant changes being made to parenting. And so my specific research is about co-parenting after a separation or divorce and how tech can be used, so apps, can be used to help uh, co-parents communicate Uh, in the context of separation and divorce. I was talking to my, uh, my partner, my husband, about this, and we were agreeing that it's horrible anyway to try to talk to your partner about co-parenting issues and all the things that sort of break down and all the issues and scheduling and everything like that. So it, and uh, it's hard enough when you like each other. And so to, uh, and, you know, even somewhat. Um, and so it, 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 this is a very challenging thing that, that co-parents have to do that some of you may be familiar with, um, that there is, there is communication that is ongoing. Uh, and actually, that's a good thing for the best interest of the child. So to sort of bring the uh, conversation back around to a focus around the best interest of the child, the idea that there is a lot of research that, that shows that it is optimal for kids to know both parents. And the changes in the, in the Divorce Act uh, are really structured around that. And I'm going to uh, talk about that. So hopefully we can open it up and have a bit of a conversation. But I'll talk first a little bit about my research and about how it relates to current changes to the Divorce Act. Um, so one of the things to think about is uh, artificial intelligence and tech and how machine learning and AI are having an impact on the way law is, is practiced and the way that families communicate and conduct their parenting lives and how children are involved in that. Um, so Stephen Hawking, before his death, was uh, really sounding the alarm about AI. And he said it's either the best thing to happen or the worst thing to happen to humanity. And that AI has this tremendous potential. And uh, there are now judicial decisions where the courts are saying we should be using artificial intelligence to be doing legal research where possible. So it is no longer a situation where we can choose not to engage with tech. We have to use it. And people are engaging with tech in a, in a number of sectors. So the research I'm doing is looking at how tech, if at all, can be leveraged how online technologies can be leveraged to help um, uh, people obtain access to justice in the family law context, and particularly in the context of how that bears upon the best interests of children and how children can thrive, families can thrive when separated um, if tech can support that. So this is the context in which my research has taken place. Um, online technology is proliferating. I don't know how many people here have a smartphone. Who does not have a smartphone? So there are some people who do not, but it, it, when I um, started my PhD, uh, few people had smartphones, and that was in 2009, and now it's, it, there's been a massive change there. It's like the students, I don't know if, if some of you teach, but um, if you, how many people's students have laptops all the time if you teach, or if you're practicing law, people communicate with you via email. You can serve documents via email. It's, it's much more rare that we do it by, by a fax. So there's lots of different ways that online technologies are touching our world in law and outside it. 
Um, the capacity of artificial intelligence is improving such that in the last couple of years, it can do some cool new things. And the interaction that we have all probably most recently had with artificial intelligence is by using the Amazon website. How many people have ever bought something on Amazon.ca or Amazon.com? So that platform, which, by the way, is owned by the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, created the Everything Store, which uses artificial intelligence uh, to prompt you to buy things that are like the things you recently bought. So artificial intelligence is very much a part of our day-to-day -day reality there. And fun fact, Jeff Bezos, if you already knew this, he is divorcing. Yes. Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos have four children, relatively young children, and they announced, last week they announced their divorce. And so they will be, I actually tweeted at him, he hasn't got back to me yet. Um, <laughs> they, they, they will be working on um, co-parenting in the context of separation and divorce. They will have a lot of resources, mind you, uh, to deal with that uh, most of us just simply don't. Um, but we have this confluence of, of technology improving, AI is enhancing its ability to, uh, to support human connections. And then we have an ongoing, uh, what's been called a crisis in access to justice. Um, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin made that comment, you know, approaching 10 years ago, the situation has not materially improved particularly in the family, family law context, the majority of people coming before the courts in family law are actually unrepresented. So um, now there's a lot of reasons for that. One is legal services are expensive. Another one is that lawyers, I was talking to a friend and colleague of mine who's practicing family law lawyer full time, and she said it's partly because as lawyers we steer our clients away from court. And for those of you who are practicing lawyers, I mean, a piece of advice that very often is given when people actually have legal advice is, do you want to try to work on this out of court? Is this, is this something they can do out of court? So unrepresented litigants are using, you know, I've seen stats that say up to 90% of the resources of the, of the court system because they are, they are sort of going in that direction. So um, there is this crisis in access to justice, particularly in the family law context where the majority of people coming before the courts don't have lawyers, but there are lawyers out there representing people in family law um, but they are often not coming before the courts, or in some cases. Um, there are changes. I'm going to talk about the changes to the Divorce Act custody provisions that will uh, be relevant all across Canada anytime it's a breakdown of a legal marriage with respect to the custody and access provisions ancillary to divorce. It's no longer going to be custody and access. It's going to be about shared parenting. Um, and so in that context, we have... Also, I didn't put it on the slide, but in increase, and you would know this, how many people are in practice, practicing family law? So you would know this, that there are an increase in families where both parents are post-divorce um, spending more time with the kids. That it's no longer, when I first started law school in like 2000, the stats was that 15% of families were and ended up with joint custody. Uh, now it's approaching more like 40% of, of families where post-divorce, post-separation, the parents have, they both have, have a share of, a significant share of time with the kids. Um, so these uh, are, uh, so in this context, online technologies and um, online dispute resolution have been explored in family law. There was actually an app a few years ago that purported to do your divorce, your whole divorce online. I don't know how many people saw that. It didn't uh, succeed. Um, and there are a number of reasons why. And when I was looking for funding for my research, that was just something that Law Foundation folks brought up. Like, that didn't work. And I, and I, I thought, well, maybe that was a little ambitious. <laughs> maybe there's a need, there's an interpersonal need for communication. But if you hive off certain aspects of this process, then there are parts of it maybe that tech can support. And it may be that people are actually using tech to support some aspects of their, um, of, of, of their communication post-separation or in the course of separation. You can file divorce online, but it's, it's complicated because you have to print it off and sign it on paper, then put it back online. Anyway, there's a number of ways it's not a perfect system yet. But, and the family court forms in Ontario are certainly not online. Um, so our, um, I was, we ran a focus group with some people in Ontario last week and, and somebody said, well, I can sign my kids up for like summer camp fully online, but I can't, I can't uh, fill in a, a court form online at all. So, um, you know, why is the YMCA better at this than the Ministry of the Attorney General? It's an interesting question, right, in terms of uses of tech. So law, the legal profession has lagged behind somewhat in terms of using tech behind some other things. 
Um, so some questions that I wanted to explore, and I'm talking today about research that is currently ongoing, so I don't have sort of a final report back, so it's more of a conversation about the research that's ongoing. Um, how can online tech aid with conflict resolution now that Bill C-78 is going to pass? So there's going to be a different regime for, for uh, parenting after divorce or separation. How does that change how relevant tech is? Um, and uh, so I wanted to talk about the research I'm doing into that um, and to, to some of the preliminary findings I have about there are some problems with that. Um, as I said, the divorce app that purported to do the divorce completely, it was too much. It was a bridge too far. It was maybe the world wasn't ready. Um, you know, they said uh, the uh, America's cars were ready for its roads before the roads were ready for its cars. So that is maybe technology ahead of its time or maybe it wasn't appropriate. Um, and what are some what are some of the potential and promise uh, for tech? So I wanted to just say a few things about C78. I don't know how many people have already looked at it. Um, as I said, it's before the Senate. It has passed the House of Commons. It's a majority government bill. Um, it, it will pass. It's just a question of when, uh, probably relatively expeditiously. Um, in uh, the most relevant change, there's there's several changes being made to the Divorce Act in that uh, legislative proposal. It's the most significant change to divorce law in over 20 years in Canada. The most significant piece to my research and also to the question of the best interest of the child um, is um, best interest test for child custody is the primary consideration. And this is something we know from case law, but it's being specifically enumerated in the statute in a different way now. So it's being put into the legislation. This already came out of case law um, and Another really key point that's highly relevant is there's a replacement of the custody and access language. So a movement away from words that sound proprietary. So custody, you know, if you have a car in your custody and control, it's your car, right? And then somebody could borrow the car and have access to it. Well, the, and, and in, in the United States, there's a lot of proprietary uh, rights in children that in various uh, state-based jurisdictions. Under this uh, legislation, this will better articulate the, the tests that have been set out under case law about how parenting is really, nobody owns the children. The children have a right of access to their parents, as Justice Louis de Bay said um, in, in uh, the best and best decision. It's the ch child's right, they are not property. Um, and so to better articulate in the language of the legislation, the tests that we see under case law and specifically moving away from proprietary ideas. And those proprietary ideas of custody and access are a big part of what people fight about, right? Because there's an emotional feeling of loss if you lose custody of your child. If you don't have custody, even if you see your child the same amount of time, people would fight, and people continue now because this hasn't yet passed, people fight for joint custody even when it doesn't make a material difference to the day-to-day -day because there's this emotional sense of loss. And some of the father's rights kind of rhetoric and, and discussion around that, the idea that there should be a default presumption of equal parenting really comes from that idea of a proprietary understanding of parents having a pro proprietary property interest in their kids. So it's a different way of looking at it that better articulates what the cases say. Um, and so instead of talking about when a parent has access and when they have custody, the, the legislation is going to talk about parenting time. So when is your parenting time? When is your parenting time? So then the issue becomes less about ownership and more about scheduling. And this is where the tech, I think, becomes more relevant. Um, so in, in, in determining um, uh, the parenting order, um, parents are to file a parenting plan. And so they're to come up with what is your plan for parenting, what is the other partner's plan for parenting, and there's utility in some level of collaboration in coming up with a joint plan that's going to be workable together. <clears throat> um, and then the decision for the court is now not to decide who gets custody, but how do you allocate parenting time? And it moves the whole discussion a couple of steps away from an idea of victory or loss. And it moves family law, hopefully the intention, is a couple of steps away from civil litigation. Or did you win your case? Did you lose your case? And there's always that joke that, oh, I got the kids. That means I won, right? Like, it seems a little bit, you know, depending on how tired you are today, it might seem problematic. <laughs> so um, the uh, allocating parenting time, is it's a different kind of decision. This actually, in some ways, doesn't completely change what's going to happen on the ground. But it, it has an emotional resonance, a symbolic resonance, and it actually makes more relevant 
um, discussions around how are parents going to be co-parenting together? Because they are, by default, under divorce law, going to be in this together, right? So this whole till death do us apart, it, if you have kids together, it's kind of true, sadly enough. Like there, and it's going, it's going to be increasingly true. As I said, I've been doing this research via online surveys as well as in-person interviews and focus groups. And one of the striking findings that anybody who is divorced or separated already knows, but it's it's interesting to me to learn more about it, is um, that people who have children together, even if they're divorced or separated, are probably talking to each other at least via email more than once a day. And so those conversations are ongoing, and it's not at all unusual to have those those uh, ongoing conversations. Now, every divorce is different, like every marriage is different, and every child is different, but it is not at all uncommon for that parenting conversation to be ongoing on a continuing basis, so often in a day that it's a stressor for both parents. So um, the goal of the legislative change is to share the parents and responsibilities, entitlements of guardianship in a different way, it's not about victory, it's not about loss, it's not about uh, property and who owns the child, it's about how are we going to allocate time appropriately so that everybody spends, so we optimize the best interest of the child and they have maximum exposure to each parent as is appropriate for their best interests. So this is, again, the new, this is gonna be the new federal approach. This has been the provincial approach in several provinces. So um, in BC since 2011, they've had this change in their provincial matters. So when it's a separation, there's no divorce. Um, in BC, they already allocate parenting time. They don't talk about custody and access since 2011. Alberta has been doing it longer. People talk about Alberta as regressive. I'm from Alberta. So it's a little, you know, little thumbs up to Alberta. They've been talking about parenting time since 2003. Um, and so these, uh, this type of change uh, to the way that custody and access is talked about is hoped to have an impact on the level of litigation. It's hoped to reduce the level of litigation, but a secondary consequence is it's actually supporting the idea that these parents are going to have to be communicating with each other and they're still partners as parents um, long after divorce. Um, so the best interest test is enumerated in the legislation. This is these, it's a non-exhaustive list. So this is this comes out of case law that's been around for a long time. Uh, the determination about what where child will reside, who sees the child and when, is always about the child's best interest. The change here is that's now expressly in the statutory provision instead of coming out of case law on a federal basis. And so there's lots of different factors. Again, it's non-exhaustive. Um, the child's needs. Spouse's willingness to support the child's relationship with the other spouse. So again, this, this presumption or this that it's going to be better to try to maximize contact between spouses. So this again all makes communication between divorced spouses very important. Um, so the research I'm doing um, is um, from the Law Foundation's Access to Justice Fund, and and what we are looking at, and we're working with a team of students at Carleton. I hope this works. Yeah, it did. Okay. Okay, just because you can already see me. <laughs> Enough of me. Um, so um, the research I'm doing is is really looking at, um, so I'm working with a team that's looking at what are people doing with tech now? How are people using tech? Like uh, the question is, you know, do you currently use tech in any way to communicate with your former partner? And, it, and it's been really interesting because a lot of people do. And they have certain interests in terms of what is of value to you? What are your concerns? Privacy has come up as a concern that a lot of people have. If I share, for example, my calendar, I don't want to share my whole calendar because it says, you know, date with Freddie on, <laughs> on, you know, the next day. Like, who's Freddie, right? So it can. Uh, so the necessity of having um, a a distinct avenue of communication. Another thing that's come up is people say, well, it's stressful to get. Because the thing about text messages, right? Like the thing about any kind of tech is it's super convenient, right? but everyone can find you all the time, right? All the time you get a text message, it's, and it's hard to ignore. And people have said that's a significant stressor if they have an acrimonious relationship with their spouse, their former spouse. Another issue that's been raised several times is if there is abuse in the real world, like IRL, there's actual abuse, or there's, there's oppression or, or some sort of power uh, imbalance, that can continue online. And it can be really, really problematic for people. So we're looking at people's experiences. So there's different dimensions to the research. <clears throat> so 
looking at doctrinal legal research, and interestingly enough, there are in excess of 100 cases from across Canada in the last 15 or so years where parents have been ordered to use an app to communicate. These apps exist. None of them are made in Canada. They, and I'm not necessarily passing them a negative judgment on them at all. There's one called Our Family Wizard. There's one called uh, Two Homes, One Family. There are several others, about six other options. The courts ha are, are ordering the use of these apps for parents to communicate. So they're mandating it. And then, so that's going to be the thin edge of the wedge or a very small percentage of people actually using those apps. Yeah. So uh, this is a very good yeah, question. You know, you're talking about yeah. So I go to family court, I'm yeah. a family judge, I do family issues. So then you're saying, okay, you're going to use this app to communicate with each other, then you don't know what you're talking about. And if I'm concerned about privacy, violence, and things like that, I don't want to give it to my spouse, but I don't want to give it to anybody else. Right. So this is a really important issue. Private data privacy is a really important issue, um, and there's and I see it at sort of two levels. Uh, one, it's at the macro level because if it's, for example, it's an app that's that's built in the United States or it's built in Sweden or Denmark or wherever, it the data is stored on servers somewhere, right? And it's those servers are in the, in the cloud, but it, wherever it's stored, it's not necessarily being stored in a way that Canada has any kind of exclusive jurisdiction over it in terms of protecting privacy. And anytime we send an email, for example, it's more like a postcard, right? So data privacy is not is something to think about at the macro level. Another issue, so in terms of where is it stored, who has access to it, another issue is um, <clears throat> what happens with that data, right? Because what we've seen from the last year is that metadata, metadata, big data, is really useful to corporations, right? They want to know, well, what kind of stuff should we sell divorced people, right? They want to know that. There is a market in that information. And so anytime there's a market information that can be gleaned from, from you know, um, from drilling into that data, then there's, there is a, what uses are going to be made of that data and by whom? And what control does the user have of that? That's, that's an issue as well. And then I think you raised this as well, but just to underscore, there is that ground level concern about data in terms of, okay, well, who else is going to see it, right? I don't know. I have teenage children. They have Instagram, right? I do not want them to put their address, their phone number, or anything on Instagram. I want them to shut down those profiles. Um, and it's the same with any kind of information. I mean, it's a gold mine about the child. If you're putting in where they are, when they will be there, contact phone numbers, personal information like you can upload photographs, you can upload health cards. You have, if there was an abduction risk or any kind of safety threat to a child, that data stream in that app is a huge risk, right? So there's data risks at this macro level from a you know, geopolitical, like who owns information perspective. Um, and 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 also at the at the very kind of drilling down uh, to the the details level, and and it can be as simple as who gets a password, right? <clears throat> and that's a real vulnerability. There's vulnerabilities in terms of encryption, right? But it's sort of like if somebody cleans the White House and they prop the door open to you know mop it at night, whatever security you have on the door is useless because the door's been propped open, right? So if, if uh, one of the people using this technology gives someone else the password, then that's a, that's a serious data breach. So there's a number of issues there. I totally think that's important. So we're looking at that. Um, so doctrinal legal research, as I said, there's in excess of 100 cases where people have been ordered to use uh, apps, and these are exclusively not made in Canada. There aren't any Canadian versions of these apps right now. There may be some in development. I don't know. Actually, I do know I have some undergrad students in, in software engineering who are working on a capstone project, but that's not something for market. They're just thinking about it. Um, but it wouldn't be that hard to do to make something in Canada. Um, so I'm looking at Canada-wide research under the Divorce Act. I'm also looking specifically at Ontario family law research, um, where it's not a divorce, because there's sort of two different genres of, of family law cases. And then I'm doing some law and society research. Um, in addition, there's a literature review of what apps are out there, how do they work, what is their functionality, how are people using them, and then mostly from uh, the study in terms of primary research is an end user study. How are people using these apps? Are they using them? And we're finding actually that a lot of people aren't using them who might be interested in using them. They've, they've just indicated, so I've done, I've had, I've had about 70 responses to our survey so far. I've had focus groups and discussions with about 20 people. And 
very few have said, no, I don't want to use tech at all. And maybe there's a kind of sampling bias that people who, who have been interested in doing the survey, interested in doing the study, um, are interested in, in using tech in some way. Um, but it does indicate that there is a, a lot of interest in, in using tech to support their communi communications. And we use tech to communicate anyway, right? I don't know if anybody has a Facebook profile or on what is it, the Facegram or the Instabook or whatever, those things. <laughs> Um, so uh, we use social media to communicate, and so this is another kind of way that people can use social media. And sometimes people are using their social media to communicate, and there's some issues with that uh, because, as we have all, those of us who have been on Facebook um, for a while and have seen how, what is it, 10 years has aged us? You know, that's the mm -hmm. thing circling right now. <laughs> um, the, the, the Facebook profile gives people all kinds of information, right? It's like a full 360 of your life. And, and people have been finding that they, they don't necessarily like those platforms because they want to have a discrete platform. Um, so some of the questions I'm looking at are, um, how are apps being ordered mandatorily by the courts? So what's happening? And they, they are. They are being ordered mandatorily by the courts. And so in what circumstances is happening? And I can just tell you, you could probably imagine when it's being ordered is when somebody's not being very agreeable, right? When somebody really wants to use one, the other person doesn't. And usually in those court cases, it has been when there is abuse or acrimonious communication. In the kind of cases where when I first started practicing law, they might order the use of a communication book rather than interpersonal communication. That's when these are being ordered, is when there, there is difficulty in the communication. So there, there is a need in that, those cases. Um, and, and the bigger question is, how are apps being voluntarily used? Because as we all know, or those of us who work in family law know, reported cases are just this tip of the iceberg of what's going on, right? Um, and, and in fact, in some cases, they're, they're going to be the worst case scenario. Most of the time, you don't, you don't want a reported case. You actually want to have some kind of settlement. How do the apps work? How might they work better? Are they serving the needs of Canadians? And could they serve the needs of Canadians better? Certainly, they, there are numerous American apps that purport to serve the needs of Canadian co-parents and say that they're used in several jurisdictions across Canada. Um, and the question is, do they, you know, because that's a real question. If, if you are being ordered to use something that isn't, a, isn't based in Canadian law, is that even relevant? And in what ways is it concerning? What are the issues that pro or problems that arise when tech is being used? Um, and how ultimately does the use of tech impact on the best interest of children? Could it support the best interest of children? And ultimately, could it support access to justice in Ontario? Could, is there, I don't think, so this is just, I'll tell you. I don't come into this thinking there's a tech solution that we will suddenly find and human beings will not have problems when they break up from their relationships. But I think there are ways tech can potentially support uh, human solutions. Um, so, concerns. So this is one, this is related to what you, you had mentioned in terms of data security. So data security and privacy, we have seen that data security and privacy are huge issues in our moment, to a point where it's pretty dystopian, actually. Um, over 25 million Facebook users had their data leaked last year, sensitive personal data. Uh, with the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, millions of law firm documents were leaked. In, in an impact that led to the resignation of a sitting prime minister in Iceland, and among other things, that was just one example. Um, so data security is, is a huge issue, but I actually don't even think it's the worst concern, um, and I'll come back to that. Um, but so uh, another issue is, as, as I said, more on the interpersonal level, manipulations of technology. And this is an extreme example, but um, I don't know how many people have Google Homes. Anybody get a Google Home? You've got smart home technology. So this is just an example of, um, this came out uh, about um, a month ago in CBC, and this woman um, reported that she was subjected to tech abuse by her former partner. This isn't specifically in a family law app, but it's an example of the manipulation of technology um, to uh, in, in uh, nefarious ways to abuse somebody. So. Um, with her ex-partner, um, web-controlled devices like locks, thermostats, and cameras, and lights were used against her. So he was able to sort of 
use the, the uh, tech she was using in her home to surveil her, to turn the lights on and off at various times, to turn on loud music at various times. I mean, admittedly, oh. this isn't that sophisticated. <laughs> a few years ago, my eight-year-old daughter at the time set a number of alarms that sounded like ducks on my phone. And I was in a, anyway, so if an eight-year-old can figure out how to make my phone make duck noises repeatedly in a board meeting, um, then you can imagine, and, and uh, if you can imagine it, people will do it. So there are vulnerabilities anytime you're using tech, and if there is an ongoing dysfunction or pattern of abuse, there's a vulnerability uh, that is presented by that technology uh, to that. So if the tech is designed to support um, constructive communication, what are the security uh, protocols? What are the protections in place? And how can the courts intervene potentially to ensure that people are not being subjected to further abuse with the tech being the tool of the abuse? Because actually sometimes even the courts can be the tool of the abuse, right? If there are abusive process. Um, so people are creative and especially when they're upset and there's nothing like a divorce to get you going. <laughs> So another issue that I actually think is, um, as I said uh, in an op-ed I had in the Law Times uh, last week, um, I think the, the bigger question is, how is the data organized? So data security is important, um, but the other issue is, um, how are things defined? How is data collected? Because if the data is collected, it can be used as evidence, which is actually kind of good in a way, right? Like just to digress for a moment. So I work as duty counsel from time to time as a per diem uh, for legal aid. And uh, I had a matter where there was, I was representing just as duty counsel for that day, a mom who said that the dad had seen the kid four weekends the last month. And he had brought an application for access and he said he'd only seen the kid for one weekend in the last month. And nobody brought any evidence of any kind. So we're sitting there at this case conference and he says one thing, she says another thing and the judge is just, you know, I don't know. Uh. Uh, should I call it three, right? Like it's very difficult, particularly unrepresented litigants often don't know how to build an evidentiary record or haven't retained documents or any kind of record that would be helpful. One of the potential uses of apps is to not only help people project into the future their communications, but also to record their communications. And in the knowledge that that communication is being recorded, it might facilitate a better type or, or genre of communication. So that's one of the one of the interesting things. But when that data is organized, what type of conduct will be characterized as what, right? If somebody misses an access visit, I can envision some pretty draconian results to that, right? If, 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 if we're not careful. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. So, uh, you know, can tech support human relationships? I mean, there were actually, um, I, you know, cyborg people now. This is not what I'm advocating. We have, instead of a marriage, just yet a, you know, a, house, a house robot. Um, maybe that's a, that might be a future we're not ready for yet. Um, but in any case, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in looking into the different ways that um, we can leverage what we now have as a, as, as a tech-enabled world uh, to solve or to help support solutions to human problems that are ongoing. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. I'd be very interested in any questions or comments. Et on a pas mal de temps pour les questions, donc n'hésitez pas. So please, uh, any questions or comments you may have. Well, I'm curious about the research you're doing with artificial intelligence and how that's helping or deciding on how to handle the situation. Well, the definition of artificial intelligence is no more. Yes. And as the machine learns, it goes along, mm -hmm. and the algorithms go along, and they, they help make decisions. So one one piece of so one of the things I'm looking at is how is AI machine learning being used in existing app technologies, and uh, one of the ways it's being used is in tone moderation in communications. So um, if people are because one of the things these apps can do is help people communicate, so you can send messages. I don't know if anybody sent a text they regretted. <laughs> so it, it, it can knock out all the F-bombs. Um, so it can uh, get rid of, of profanity, so you can signal particular words. And it may, in, in the context of that, existing technologies may not already do this, but there may be sort of trigger points and flashpoints in people's relationship, and that may be a piece of learning it could use. Do you, like, 
for example, in addition to a number of swear words, maybe your mother might be something, you know, you're just like your father, you're just like your mother. Maybe take that out of the communication. So in terms of the learnings, um, the, the in, in some ways, a, an ideal um, app could learn how to be supportive in those parenting conversations and not set off the kind of noise that pe prevent people from, from uh, communicating. Right, so you'd you know, need... You really have to go blind to yep. behaviors. There's, there's documentation that occur on an individual basis for a thousand, two thousand, a hundred thousand years right. in order for that machine to come back and say, hey, we're going to tone this down for you. Right, and so that's one of the interesting things that big data could be used for in terms of uh, accumulating the communications across a variety of different uh, cases. And one of the things about the case-by-case -case type of decision-making that happens in common law is that data really isn't capped through the courts. We don't have that same type of back and forth of what types of communication are problematic. Um, and, and so it is possible that this that tech, by uh, looking at those um, text uh, back and forth or those messaging back and forth could learn, just in much in the same way as if you use a Google email, it may um, prompt, it may suggest words for you, suggest you know conclusions to sentences and things like that. Um, but, you know, I tell Apple, I never mean duck. I never mean duck. I don't know if that happens to you. Right? <laughs> it just gets rid of a word I use sometimes. <laughs> um, so does that answer your question in terms of uh, some of the ways? I mean, there's lots of other ways. Um, you but that with chat boxes. You know, the, 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 the algorithm is taking in the information, but you still have to write the algorithm. You have to say, OK, which of these words can I really Right. So you, you have to feed the machine until it gets to a certain point where it's able to continue on. Right, and you have to be careful, and this is where it becomes, the nuance is really important, because if it removes certain words, but those words are actually significant, and then you can't communicate yeah, you, about important yeah. things, right, particularly, and, and it may, different things became, become relevant as children age, for example. There may be certain types of conversations that were not constructive at one point that may then be constructive later and because they're about the kids or something like that. Like there, there may be a variety of different um, ways that it has to be nuanced and it has to change. So it presents a pathway to communication instead of a barrier of communication. Yeah. Thank you. So I was very uh, interested in that idea that courts are ordering the use of apps. Yeah. And I'm curious to know, so what's the conversation around that? Uh, for people that don't want to do that, are there conversations around, I don't know, the rights of a tech-free life, and are there conflicts? So how, how is law organizing mm -hmm. uh, those kind of practices? That's a, that's a really good question in terms of what arguments are raised to refute the requirement that people use this tech. I have not yet seen a case where it's been argued in a kind of legalistic way, a kind of objection to um, to tech incursions on on private lives. Um, I haven't seen anything like the you know the the issue that came up in the EU a few years ago about the Google right to be forgotten. Um, that has not come up. So and it's probably because in general the people who are using this this is in their interpersonal life and uh, Oftentimes, they're not necessarily legally sophisticated or they're not necessarily legally represented. So objections to the use of these apps have not been made in a kind of legal frame. Um, and the courts do have that discretion where the paramount consideration is best interest of the child. Um, so that hasn't gone up to sort of an appellate level where the question is, um, does a person's right to privacy, for example, under the Charter, right to privacy, um, trump or, or override um, this best interest test? And in what circumstances and how would that work? So that, that hasn't been tested. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the main objection to using, like, my family is in the mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the main reason the judge is ordering is that it will ban the use of the device. You mean personality disorders and violence on the mail and then also the use of the computers as tools can I say. Yeah. And um, that's what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, just a, a footnote, uh, my family is used to be Canadian, it was developed originally in Canada. Um, it wasn't made in college originally. And then I also want to uh, sort of dominate my family, because I want to play some ideas on uh, uh, technology and family law. I 
think that uh, one of the areas that uh, uh, technology can come in is um, in family law, uh, a lot of the problems, aside from the personality disorders, a lot of the problems that uh, these parents face are uh, you have children with two homes uh, working in a society that's designed for children with one home. So uh, you have dental billing software that can't accept two addresses of two parents. Slowly changing. Mm -hmm. You have um, old hip cards that uh, really just uh, are part of the challenge for the old hip cards. And now, now we can get a second old hip card uh, for two homes, just like our states and provinces. And uh, I think that that's where technology can start to uh, solve a lot of the, I call them stones that choose uh, that are preventing these kids from uh, engaging in normal recreational activities because their schedules don't mm -hmm. integrate with uh, the schedules that are designed for children with one home. Uh, I think that um, billing software is very important. Uh, communication software, like right now, not all the school boards in uh, Ottawa even will um, send out a second report card. Principal, and you gotta you know, bust someone, and this becomes a communication issue that's foisted onto the two parents to deal with. But really, it's an institutional issue. And again, at, at the private schools, quality of technology. So, if you want school communications to go to grandma, go parent, no problem. But the public schools, the unionized environment, uh, they're still struggling with that. But it, there's all kinds of these technological solutions that are readily out there. Yeah, so there's so much value in, in everything you've said, and I just want to flag a couple of things. Um, and, and it goes back to that sort of idea of, you know, the the cars being ready for America's roads before the roads were ready for the cars, in terms of these technologies may have uh, an efficacy and, and a utility that our other institutions are not ready for, right? Um, so schools, in terms of how they disclose things, whether you can, whether you're allowed to use email to communicate with, with, a, with a school, um, things like that, and those things are changing, but they're changing more slowly in large <clears throat> institutions. And another thing that I have heard from various people is, actually, this is a side issue in terms of co-parent communications using software, and the real issue is, why aren't the courts using um, tech in ways that would smooth and expedite processes um, such that the parents wouldn't, because as you say, some of this conflict is foisted on the parents, Whereas if the institution dealt better with it, there wouldn't be such a conflict. So, for example, to get a motion date, I mean, I don't know if people practice it. To get a motion date, you must go, at least in Ottawa, you have to go there and sit and talk to a person who writes on a paper file that then gets transposed in the computer, you know, what your motion date is. Which means two people have to, oh, somebody's got to either send their lawyers or take a day off work. You're not sure what time you're going to be heard. And if those types of things, it's just about securing the date, could be done online somehow. Some of these back and forth between people would be reduced. So there's a number of different moving parts, as you say, in terms of the institutions like OHIP, institutions like the family courts, um, institutions like educational institutions as well. And so it's a complicated set of problems. So my particular research is looking at a discrete piece of that, but I do think there are other questions to be asked, and there's a lot of other research to be done. And I do think a future where um, we use tech better to support our parenting and our personal lives is of great benefit in the context of separation or divorce. But it's also, as I started by saying, this already is awful. Can't, trying to like co-parent with someone you like is bad enough. And so um, there, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I love my children. So. Um, but but there, there, it's a challenge. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a wicked problem. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so ways that we could advance our society using technology by advancing this interpersonal challenges could be really beneficial. Yes? Um, the way I see it, there are two main issues for technology and family law. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the court system and whatnot, because that's a different bag of worms. Yeah. Uh, likewise, the old hit cards and the court cards and whatnot, I'm not going to get into that. The way I see it, there are two issues. One is uh, the 
issue of allowing parents or co-parents. So for example, my family was really brought up and I never really uh, any issues. On the one hand, I feel that since it's for adults, how would you think it's that relevant where the uh, software was produced, whether it's produced in the US or in Denmark or whatever country in the world? I'm not talking about the location of the data, that's a separate issue of course, but the location of where the software is produced, I don't think is is very relevant at the end of the day. Most of these softwares don't really take into account the uh, legal nature of the orders. It's mostly for communication purposes. Uh, and the communication between parties, barring cultural differences, it's not really all that different in Canada, than it is in France, than it is in South Africa or any other, other, any, any other country out there. Um, so I don't know how, how relevant the, uh, the location of the software is. Uh, terminology of custody accessing the software, you know what, that would be a simple trip to find it in your place, a personal place, just to do that. Uh, another main issue where I think technology is very interesting is with the patent law, and pretty far from it, it's the machine learning, you mentioned it as AI. Um, we're trying to assist, especially self represented litigants, in coming to an understanding of what the court could potentially award in a given case. A lot of people feel that they have uh, entitlement to go to court and to fight and to maybe win, hopefully. Um, and they often don't win and they're disappointed and they don't understand why they don't win. Whereas if they had talked to a lawyer or somebody, they would screen through maybe AI in the process, they would find out that their parents have been doing full custody in this matter is slim to none, maybe they'd have a better chance of joint custody. Um, there are a fair amount of AI applications out there in other fields as well. Uh, there's a big company, well not a big, but there's a startup company in Toronto called DJ Legal, and they deal specifically with uh, tax law and employment law. Granted, those two fields are a little bit more uh, factual based, it, it's easy to quantify the data. How long have you been employed? What was your salary? You know, or, or what are you fighting on the tax front? Family law is a little bit more gray, so a lot more factors that are very difficult to quantify. But I think that's probably where the future is going to lie. A lot of my time, I'm, I'm in private practice, a lot of my time I spend calling my clients who got no chance in hell of obtaining what they're trying to obtain. Uh, I suggest that you either don't fight, and if you want to fight, then quite frankly, I'm the only one who's going to benefit by you paying your bill, and you're still not going to get what you want. Um, and I find that I sometimes get fired <laughs> for saying that, but they end up then getting exactly what I said they would get. <laughs> I think that's really the two fields where computers are going to help. Uh, I've, I've seen many courts order my family lawyers for similar software before. Your point with regards to, or some of these points with regards to, would a court, uh, or would a uh, litigant be able to perhaps fight the issue? I've never had a judge force it upon me that he didn't want to. Always on agreement of the parties. It was communications only by SMS or only by email or only by family visit. I can't imagine a judge forcing somebody who is dead set philosophically against using the software using poor things to technology. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And on that last point, as I said, I've never seen that. I've never seen a situation where somebody is philosophically opposed to the use of technology being forced to use technology. I mean, it's theoretically possible because we do have these court orders happening. It could happen. You could have somebody who's, you know, the free man on the land type of, um, you know, rhetoric around that. That it's it's conceivable. Well, um, what uh, happens is you, you you don't oppose the use of technology until later on you find out how the technology is being used. So in the case of Facebook. We didn't mind. People were going on and building my friends. I've got 15, 20, 25, 100 people. Everything was fine. Not knowing that the company behind that was using that information and other information that you put on. So I went, I checked a, a diabetes website, I checked a, a divorce website, and building profiles on you. Mm -hmm. And pretty accurate profiles because of the algorithms that are being created, which is being used by other companies. So it's the I understand that you try to use technology to facilitate that discussion because you don't want the kids to suffer, and I agree. But do it with uh, eyes wide open. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that that is your tone is very similar to my thinking on this in terms of 
cautious movement forward, right? Like on the one hand, we may not be able to not move forward. We may have to move forward into a tech-enabled world. And, 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 but it, there, there's, a, there's a good reason to be very cautious about a number of aspects. I wanted to talk, uh, just to address an earlier comment you made about the location of the software development. And I'm not here to say it's necessarily bad that the software companies are in the United States or they're not in Canada. In fact, that there may be some inevitability to that because the American market is so much bigger than ours and the American divorce rate is higher than ours. So, you know, yay them. Um, but in any event, it's because their marriage rate's higher. We still break up all the time. Um, but the, uh, the, there, there is going to be, in, much like in the entertainment industry, any, any industry where there's not protections, there's going to be uh, American um, domination of that in, in a large extent in Canada. Um, it may not be a problem. And as you said, what these apps currently do, the existing ones do, is they, they largely do scheduling. But you also said, and I think it's really interesting, it's something I've heard from other people, um, is that people are at a deficit of information. And maybe that's good in terms of legal advice, that, that as lawyers we can package and sell that information in some ways that, that are tailored to the particular situation. But sometimes it's information that you, you don't want to charge someone for, right? Like basic information, or it might be useful to reinforce what you say as an individual with a, you know, a second a kind of an, an, an artificial second opinion in some ways. Um, so it may be that there is a missed opportunity with these technologies. They're not yet covering the field of what they could do. And I think that's probably, probably true, but you make a really good point. Yes, somebody else. Uh, no, yep. Parenting time. Yep. Um, in, in my mind equates to access mm -hmm. before it used to be okay so McDonald's on Wednesday every second weekend thank you very much yeah that was the recipe that doesn't go necessarily there was that other uh, um, decision making authority mm -hmm. and that that is uh, where the battle is really mm -hmm. yeah okay and that's more linked to who has custody of this kid and mm -hmm. can make decision about education, this and that, and even moving around possibly. Um, so, um, and changing the vocabulary won't change the people. Uh, technology uh, wiping out uh, offensive words to me is only camouflaging the aggression that uh, mm -hmm. still is uh, within that person. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, talking about evidence. Well, let's wipe it out. Um, so uh, I am uh, somewhat uh, taken aback by, um, of course, when everybody is reasonable, <laughs> OK, it, everything works well. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in, in, in this divorce uh, separation scenario, uh, nobody uh, starts with reasonability. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a really so I am yeah. a little weary of oh, this is such a good thing and yeah, and it's gonna make uh, the interest of the child uh, put to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe if the kid was using the app. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the parents, <laughs> yeah. I have a greater faith. Yeah. In fact, I don't understand why the judge with the man said once in the month, or oh no, four times in the month, and the wife said once in the month, why didn't they ask the kid? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. But whatever. Yeah. The family law is always a mystery. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is, I, I so you make some very important points. I mean, one of the, the benefits would be the appointment of the children's lawyer, which ultimately, by the way, is what we did in that case, thank you, is we, we sought the appointment of the children's lawyer to have the child mm. be represented. That's not always available. It's publicly funded. And, and uh, But the idea of, of, of a child as they get older, having some access to the app is something that I've heard from other parents as well. Um, some people use Google calendars and they, have, they allow at least an adolescent child to propose events. And so having increased participation by uh, at least a teenage child in different aspects of that sort of time sharing might be a way to support the best interest of the child as it, it grows over time. 
it's interesting because I've heard from sort of two people this idea of you know changing, going to the legislation and viewing it critically, changing the language to talk about parenting time and decision making authority. Is that just an edit, find, change the words from custody and access, or is this a more meaningful foundational change? And I think the intention is to make this a more meaningful change. I don't know if it's actually going to make it a more meaningful change. And so I think that's that's a really that's a question about the legislation. That's the um, much like a lot of the legislation that's recently been proposed with just symbolic gestures, how much of the symbolic gesture actually filters down into meaningful change? That's, I think, the theme of this moment in our Canadian democracy, but that's just, I'm digressing. Um, yes? Uh, I have two questions. Yes. Um, so, so this is very interesting, and I'm wondering whether these um, tools uh, could also be, well, or whether you see them as also actually education tools for the parents. So is it only just about, uh, well, that communication goes through better, so yeah. we can, you know, uh, um, have joint decisions about the children, or is it that through the use of these tools, the parents will actually learn, well, okay, oh, this was the right, this is a better way to say things, because I actually get a good response from the other one. Um, so is, is this an education tool? So that's the first question. And the second one is about the place of the best interest of the child. So obviously it's a principle that's always been there in the law and in, in practice for um, determining um, the custody and, and access cases. So it's the, it's the only determining factor for the outcome. But do you think it's reinforced it's, Reinforced in in the um, in the in the bill there in a way that it would have a, a, a more important a, a greater weight uh, not just in the outcome but more generally in, in applying that as a lens to everything you know as a more of a general mm -hmm. principle uh, now that it's you know it's it's more clearly defined etc. I know the test is there. And, mm -hmm. So uh, just to take the, the first part of your question, um, with respect to, it's interesting because you're talking about AI as machine learning. Well, maybe the machine can be the trainer, right? Maybe in, in uh, supporting people's communication to sort of delete or give people a second thought about what is, what's an appropriate way or a constructive way to communicate, maybe that there can be human learning too. And certainly when I was taking my conflict resolution mediation training, that was one of the ideas of transformative mediation that in the process of dispute resolution, you can facilitate and support people to learn new ways to interact with each other. So it may be that the technology in it, really, if we wanna, what do they say in, in business? Blue sky it, wouldn't that be cool, right? Wouldn't that be cool if we could actually use the technology to support better interactions, or at least simulate them, right? So let's say your former partner says, yeah, you stupid cow, I'll pick up the kids, and then and they changes it to say, thank you so much for asking. I will be happy to pick up the children. You know, maybe that, you know, it's possible, right? So I, I think that's a wonderful idea in terms of what are the possibilities for this technology? And, and it's up for those tech innovators to sort of imagine that, you know, and I think that's great to imagine that. The second piece of the best interest. So by putting this explicitly in the legislation, it provides a signal or a sign um, that, that's out there for non-lawyers looking at this legislation to explain that the best interest test is important because previously although that was the test that all lawyers knew was the test the misinformation or the the if the legality in the minds of the average person does not coincide with the with the actual legal test and so it has a reality i mean from a critical perspective it has a reality so when i have lots of people who come in uh, and, and say, when I'm acting as duty counsel, I want to sign off parental rights. I, I don't know if you hear this, but, or I want to get all the parental rights. So, you know, I hear this all the time, which means it has this kind of existence in our culture. So to the extent that the change in the legislation might have an impact on changing people's perceptions, I think that would be helpful because people go to lawyers and they act in, in these cases on the basis of their preconceptions. As you say, they want certain things. They come into to a, a court proceeding wanting certain things. So if it can guide what people know and expect, it might be really helpful to foreground those best interests so that people don't go in with this one understanding of what they're doing and it ends up being something quite different. Really good question. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's ever been any cases where 
um, the parents have been instructed by the courts to only use the actors communicate with each other because if there's some sort of massive difference between the tone that's used uh, through your communications via the app versus the conversations that you have with your telephone I don't know how helpful the tone um, corrector would be really in uh, you know ameliorating the relationship and improving better cooperation between the parents so it's interesting because it would place a reliance on that technology, right? So, and there are cases where people are mandated to only communicate using, whether it's SMS, using email, using a particular app. And so in that case, you end up um, having the communication moderated by this basically technological third party. Um, and so it is true that anytime you, you would sort of breach that protocol and actually talk in person, it would shift the dynamic, but to answer your question, yes. But it is an interesting, um, it is an interesting dimension to it because you end up having an ongoing co-parenting relationship with this person filtered through this, this, you know, this type of filter, right? So I'm just thinking it's almost like a social media profile that's curated, the curated version of your ex instead of the in real life version of your ex, uh, and so there, there is this kind of existence that ends up happening. And does the author see how the tone has been changed in his or her communication? Like, because, yes. I mean, it would be helpful probably mm -hmm. from their perspective also to know how they're being portrayed to their former partner. So, and that's, that's interesting. I mean, that, that's, I mean, it would show sort of underlines right now, but a potential thing that could happen is it could, it could give you a monthly report. I don't know if you get these on your phone. Apple tells me my, my, Phone usage was down 30%, 31% last week or whatever. Maybe I could say, your profanity use was down 31% last week. <laughs> well done. Here's a dollar off at Starbucks. Um, you know, these are things. So it's interesting because all of these things would be actually pretty easy to code, easy to do. <laughs> That's a lot of personal information. Yes, Apple knows too much about me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, frankly, um, I read this op-ed that said, we are living in a, a silly 90s dystopia of personal information because it's, our personal information is, is being collected, but it isn't necessarily kind of meaningful, deep, thoughtful things. It's, you know, what kind of shoes we like to shop for. That's, that's the kind of information that's out there about us. So this sort of mundane minutia of our lives is, is all over the place. Yeah? I'd like to, uh, to point out that the court can be extremely creative. Uh, as to how people can communicate. I've had, I had a phone case about a, I think it was eight months ago or a year ago, where it wasn't granted very, very intense hospitalization, where the mother had very serious mental health issues. Um, and we had to get a family court clinic assessment, and it was, it was on a different level of litigation. However, uh, I was representing the dad. We needed to permit the mother to find out about all the decisions the dad was making while giving dad full custody rights to the child. However, if the mother ever were to, to, to I don't want to say cure it, but if she were to be okay to speak to a real provider, she could use that kind of form. So what we decided, uh, what we proposed to the judge and the judge granted it was a Google Drive, whether you're a Google or not, fine. Uh, but a Google Drive where only the father could place documents, he would place the report cards, he would place the medical records, he would place whatever else regarding the children. Um, the mother would be able to read it, but would not be able to add it. Um, so there are many ways of, of dealing with either the tone and changing the tone or making the conversation one directional. Uh, there's a lot of creativity available in this, in this tool. Uh, it doesn't always have to be just because both parties are mean uh, or are unable to communicate. But there can be some more serious and that, so that's really interesting because it's not a mutual agreement to communicate a certain way. It's a court-ordered um, platform for communication as opposed to a channel, mutual channel. And, and another thing that's interesting about that is the idea that Google, I'm not advertising Google, but what I've heard from a variety of people, including what you've just said, is there are platforms we already use that don't actually cost money. And coming back to the cost issue, there are actually uh, general-use platforms that can be leveraged to do some of these functions, to have some of this functionality um, in ways that are perhaps less problematic too, right? That it, it may be one of the sort of outcomes of my research might be to curate a kind of a list of, here's some stuff you can do. Um, here's some creative 
tech solutions that aren't actually packaged as family law tech solutions, but actually we can use them in a lot of contexts. And, and uh, for example, emails that can be put into a digest format. So you don't get an email tw every 20 minutes from your ex. You get an email at the end of the day that summarizes the content. So you wait, you have a glass of wine, then you open it. <laughs> or you don't, I don't know. Um, but, but to sort of have more control. Um, and so we can we can use one of the things I've heard from from parents um, is that they they would like to have more control and more clear boundaries in those relationships. So like you're talking about the Google Drive, then the information is being provided, but there is a kind of boundary in terms of the of the way that interaction is taking place. So there's tons of potential, and interesting enough, there's tons of stuff people are already doing and in in the in practice and in courts that isn't really being systematically being uh, collected or and it's it's not that well understood and so my goal is to try to help understand better what's happening what uses people are putting tech to what uses tech could have um, and how ultimately co-parents can have better access to justice so. any final question or no yeah. just one little sure. question out of curiosity because you actually correct me because I'm not a, a student in law I'm a lawyer yeah Divorce. Yeah, I didn't get it. So <laughs> now uh, that being said, I was wondering if, of course, um, the family law is different in uh, Ontario and mm -hmm. Quebec, and of course, I understand your whole uh, study is about Ontario law. But and I'm not, sh I, I'm not sure about what I'm, what I'm going to say because, like I said, I'm not divorced. But I heard that when uh, when you were a Quebecer and you divorced. Um, or you separate, whatever, mm -hmm. yep. and there's um, children as well. Yep. I I think it's mandatory to get a mediation mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. mediation, yep. like yep. a mediation, yep. and I think pretty good things about that. And and I never heard of an of a communication or whatever agenda apps for co-parenting. Co-parenting, maybe it's just that I'm not divorced and I don't have to deal with those kind of questions. But, and maybe not, it's just a comment, but it seems like it, it, it's so sad. <laughs> I know it's a stupid yep. comment, but it, it's it, not stupid, that's it, true. Is it the same thing yep. in Quebec? And is it like, do people have to get like, order from the court to communicate? Or do you guys know who is So I want, in response to what you're saying, specifically with reference to the Quebec context, these apps are not available in French. I thought was my next question. So you could use an English app and use French words, but at the end of the day, this is this is one of the potential problems with not having a Canadian-based platform is it's not in French. And also the, the, the legal regime for separation is very different in Quebec than from, you know, every province is different, but Quebec is unique in a different, a, it's more different, right? Um, and so, um, the, but because it's civil law system and, um, and, I, and again, I don't know that much about you know how things operate in Quebec, but but I think that jurisdiction actually does matter. Um, and also, the uh, this is something I hadn't mentioned previously, but with respect to the C78, that's actually one of the changes in this law is they are moving more in the direction of mandating people at least sign a certificate that they know mediation is available or that they've considered the possibility of mediation. So it is a push towards mediation, which. As someone with mediation training who's a mediator, I actually think is generally probably a good idea. Um, that can be faster. I mean, there are issues with you know potential where there's abuse and, and things like that. But um, trying to so there's a general movement out of the sort of formal court system there. So I think that does that address at least part of what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, it is sad. It is sad, but in a way, it doesn't have to be sad because when we look at around 25 to 30% of Canada's children are growing up in families where the par parents are not together. Um, this is a reality. And so we have to do better um, in our society of, of just understanding this is the reality. And it can be, you know, I don't know if anybody saw this, this ad before, it's like a joke, on um, a meme online before Christmas is, you know, little Johnny hopes his parents divorce before Christmas in time for him to have two presents, right? <laughs> there could be some pros, you know. Like, <laughs> You know, and, and especially if the parents are high conflict, it might there might be kind of a happiness there. Yeah. Um, I just like to mention, uh, I, I'm a lawyer in Ontario, but I'm also a lawyer in Quebec. I practice exclusive family, exclusive family law. Uh, quite frankly, uh, two things. First of all, the Divorce Act is a federal regulation. Yes. Yep. And therefore, if somebody falls under the Divorce Act, it's the same thing whether you're in the Yukon Territory or 
on Prince Edward Island or anywhere. If you're not divorced uh, and you were sort of common law, so to speak, whatever that falls into today, um, then yes, there are differences with regards to parenting. That said, the differences mostly are procedural. At the end of the day, the best interest test would still apply. For the most part, it's the same. There are some of the parental authority because that's the cat on down in terms of this and the other provinces. But honestly, it's just a matter of the icing on the cake. The cake is still the same cake. But I guess my question was more about before that. Like, do you think, like you're a lawyer on both sides, yeah. do you think mediation has, it is a good way to maybe avoid that after? Or? I, I, don't, I don't know about after the fact, but definitely before the fact, absolutely. In fact, every time that somebody comes into my office and seeks a divorce, by law, I must tell them that they have an opportunity to conciliate, there are counselors available, there's mediation services. I have to sign on this court form that says that I swear that I told the person. Well, it's not a swear, but I, <laughs> I, I, but I have. But I have done it. Yeah. Uh, so you have you have to do that regardless. And that for your client, it's a choice. It's a choice. I mean, it's ironic because sometimes I have a client who comes into my office and there's some serious, serious issues of abuse, and uh, I tell them, okay. I tell them, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to do this. The law says I really should. I'm aware. It's probably not going to work. Are you aware that there's counseling that's not available? Done. Next. Move on. And I literally take yeah, yeah. seven to ten seconds doing it. Uh, we have some discretion, but it's, it's pretty minimal. And that comes around to, just to reiterate, yes, the Divorce Act is federal legislation, so it applies in all jurisdictions across Canada. Um, but it's important to think about, and I, this has been outside the scope of what I talked about today, but how much divorce law has changed uh, over the last 40, 50 years in Canada. Prior to 1968, you had to get an act of parliament to get a divorce. I mean, judges would protect marriage. You could be denied a divorce. You'd be forced to live in that marriage. So we have a very different understanding now of the voluntariness of marriage, consent wasn't really part of continuing in a marriage, right? So we have very different ideas about marriage and the continued evolution of divorce I think potentially, well, I think is going in the direction of um, having more and more communication by former partners post separation, post divorce, and in that communication, you know, in terms of optimizing that communication, I think there's there's a role for that. I, I think that, that the Oxford University Press just last year published the first book of human rights in Canada, the first book of human rights, looking for something like this, and I think uh, family law is going to evolve. Um, to include more human rights issues, especially family status and things of that nature. And uh, family law is definitional. Like in our conversation today, we were really talking about mediation, talking about those different trends. But family law uh, has its roots in the old poor laws, and uh, it also involves the community. You know, there's just a uh, few years ago where we ended the child support and clawback for parents who were on certain assistance, but there's still. Uh, Clawbacks for you know, other things, yeah. and so family law is not just between the two parents. It also involves schools, school bus services, mm -hmm. uh, social assistance, yes. ODSP, uh, the challenge at the end of the uh, my uh, uh, ODSP spouses and the way they're treated. Uh, we're way behind the majority of European things on family law and health, and I think that again with this new. Uh, Minor changes to the divorce act. I think the future of family law is going to be using the human rights code and the charter to change some fundamental um, aspects for how children are treated by the court. That's. I mean, that's really interesting. Certainly, although family law is private law. The charter has had a massive impact in family law in the last 20 years with the legalization of same-sex marriage. And and in Ontario, for example, who can be a parent? And the idea that you can have multiple parents, you have three parents. And so some of the very fundamental, you know, taken for granted assumptions about what families are have changed with respect to human rights law and, char and charter litigation. So I suspect that will continue. So, yeah. Did you have a question? Sorry. I was just curious if your research will um, address uh, an emotional side of uh, the use of the thing because <clears throat> we have been talking a lot about facts and some uh, very factual stuff. But the, the way I see it, a big benefit of those apps is that people would, would could be, I'm sure, be, well, it's only being hypothesized. <laughs> they could feel they have a platform where they are listened to. Mm -hmm. And 
it's probably easier to do the follow-ups because let's say you receive an email from your uh, ex-partner mm -hmm. through your 200 emails you receive every day. Yeah. It's harder to remind to do the, the follow-up. So that's a big benefit I see. Mm -hmm. the, the other benefit I see is that how the people would feel respect mm -hmm. that way and that would improve the communication. So I was curious if your research would uh, address that. So these are some of the things that I want to look at, but in terms of people's reporting back, um, what people have said to me who are in this situation is it, it's overwhelming and difficult and stressful to have these communications coming through their, their, their other platforms. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, they feel the kind of triggering and dysfunctional d dimensions of their communication with their former partner are kind of reiterated there. So if it's controlled for and there's a different way of doing it, um, then that could be of great benefit. In terms of psychological benefits, one of the things that um, people have said to me when I've met with them is it's an amazingly isolating experience getting divorced. You, 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 know, you get married with 100 guests, you get divorced, maybe all alone, right? And, uh, and, and uh, some of the people who've attended focus groups have said, well, this is great. This is the first time I felt like I'm part of a community. I'm supported. It's, so, it's been a weird kind of ancillary thing in terms of people feeling supported that there's a community of people experiencing that. Um, and so if the apps can be supportive and capacious, providing some space for people to feel heard, even if that's sort of simulated, it can change people's level of like their emotional state. And so they'll be less reactive and potentially more able to communicate better. But that's probably happening on both sides to, to men and women and same sex partners as well. So uh, I think that's those are some really important insights. I mean, I'm not a psychologist. It would be interesting further research for psychologists to do to look at what is the impact on people's emotional state in terms of their mental health? Um, if Can tech support people's mental health to be um, less endangered during, during divorce and separation? I saw stats a few years ago that um, the majority of people going through a divorce or separation go through phases of mental health that's at the clinical level, that it is actually a normal step in, in getting a divorce or separation that you're going to be really upset and have mental health issues. And so any, in any way to um, support people through that can actually support their mental health. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh,